Hey guys, thanks for joining me for another episode of Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is a brand new game that's put out by IDW Games, and is a 2-5 to five player game that is semi-cooperative and competitive. In the game itself, it takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half to play each scenario, and the game can be played as, as a single scenario, or you can chain it together into an overall story that will have effects based on whether the turtle players win or lose a scenario. So from there, the uh, one player will play the villain and will control all the villains in the game and do his best to thwart the turtle players. The other players will take on the roles of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. All four turtles will always be included in the game, so depending upon the number of players will de determine how many, play how many turtles the players are controlling each. So, as far as the game itself, my impressions of it so far have been very good. I've really enjoyed it. I grew up with the Turtles. I loved watching the cartoon back when I was a little kid. And when I heard that they were doing this on Kickstarter, I was a backer right away. I had to check it out. Uh, the game looked really cool. And I couldn't wait to get my hands on the miniatures. As, like I said, I'm a miniatures fan, so I have really looked forward to seeing what they would do with those. And I can't tell you enough that I was very pleased with both the aesthetic look of the game and how they the miniatures came out and all that, and how the game plays. Uh, they did a really good job with this game, in my opinion. The game plays very well. The turtle players work together. Uh, the one thing that really, really uh, in, draws me in is the way that they combine uh, the way that the turtles work. So each turtle player will have a set of action dice that they will roll at the beginning of each round. And they're going to set those dice up in front of them in a row. The dice to their left and right at the end of their, their line will be able to be used by the turtle players to their left and right. So based on how each player sets up their dice, we'll be determining what the players can do as actions for each of the turtle players. The only exception to this is Raphael. He is a lone warrior and refuses to take help from the other turtles. So unlike the rest of the turtles that get three dice, he will be rolling six. But he will share his dice, so it is still as important how that player lines the, the dice up as well. So I really liked that aspect, which means that it keeps the players working together, talking each other to each other, and being active throughout the game as they all kind of kind of contribute um, to the different effects. I also liked that they did a good job balancing both the villain player and the turtles. As playing the villain, um, you can definitely win the scenario. You're not overpowered. The turtles aren't overpowered, which you'd kind of expect the turtles to have a little bit of a advantage. Um, so I think they did a good job as far as the balancing. I haven't played too many uh, missions yet, so I can't say 100% that everything has been balanced. But as far as I've seen so far, the, the game itself plays very well. Other than that, they did a good job of, of having enough rules to keep it interesting, but not overburdening the game with rules. Uh, they, they give it just enough to give it enough variety and to keep it fresh, but they don't have un useless rules in there that just bog the game down, which some of the games that I've played uh, definitely fall into that category. So let's go ahead and head to the table, and I'll teach you guys how to play. So the first set of dice we're going to look at are the Turtles Action Dice. Each turtle is going to have their own custom action dice that will have a various set of symbols on them. And each turtle will also have one custom symbol that only their dice will have. So as you can see here, these are Raphael's dice as they are red. And he, his special symbol is the two Shuken. And then the other turtles, as you can see here, also have their own custom symbol where Michelangelo has two skateboards, Leonardo has two katanas, and Donatello has a katana and a turtle shell. So let's go ahead and take a look at each one of these different symbols on the dice and we'll go through what they do. So the first one is the turtle shell, which is a defensive dice. When a turtle has that symbol on their action dice, then they will gain plus one defense during any defensive rolls that they have to make that turn. The next one is the skateboard, which will allow a turtle to move up to its movement value for each skateboard that you spend. Next we have the katana which will allow you to make a melee attack. From there then we have the shugen which will allow you to make a ranged attack and then as we said Raphael has a pair of those and then finally the chi symbol which when you roll that when you resolve it you'll get to heal 
a number of wounds based on the number of hits that you roll on the battle dice. You get to gain a focus back up to your maximum number of focus. And then finally, you'll get to change that dice to any other symbol on the dice except for another chi symbol. Here we have the battle dice and the six different symbols that you'll find on each one. So there are three sides that have a single hit, one side that has a double hit, and two sides that have the, the turtle shells or the defensive side. So when a model makes a defensive roll, these are successes. And when a model take, makes an attack roll, these are considered successful hits. For the hero player setup, each player is going to choose a turtle that they want to play as and will receive their dashboard, which will list the turtle's name at the top and their special ability that they have. So each player is going to want to familiarize themselves with that. From here, then, we have the turtle's hit points, which there are two different ways you can track it. You can either receive that turtle's hit points at the beginning of the game. So each uh, full pizza is five points, and each slice is one point. So Leo has 12 hit points. Or you can start with no hit points and add pizza to it as you take damage, which is usually how I play it. From here, then, you have the hero stats. So his movement value, attack, defense, skill, and focus. And at the bottom is a quick reference so that you know what symbols are on each of the action dice for that turtle. From here, you can give the turtle his three action dice, or in Raphael's case, his six action dice. You will also receive five manhole covers. And based on the hero's focus, you'll receive that many focus tokens. So Leo has three focus, so he'll receive three. And then finally, depending upon the scenario that you're playing, there may be modifiers to it, but each... Uh, Turtle will have a skill value, which is the number of special ability cards that they will be able to choose from and have in the game. Any special abilities that the turtle does not use will be returned to the game box. So, for example, with the scenario that we're playing, we're only going to be allowed to have, we're going to have minus two to our skill. So, Leo will start the game with two special ability cards. So, he's going to go ahead and tape leaking, Leaping Strike, and I'll hold them off. The rest of the special ability cards will be returned to the box. The villain player setup is pretty straightforward. So depending upon the mission that you guys have selected to play, it'll list the different villains and you can go ahead and grab their dashboards. The, their dashboards are the same as the turtles. At the top you have the villain's name, any special abilities that villain has, their life, and their stats for move, attack, defense, and evil. In the rule book, it doesn't list anything about evil, so I would assume at some point that will be included in one of the expansions to what the effects of that are. From here, based on the mission that you're playing, you will also grab a number of figures for each of those. So in our mission, we're playing the first one, so we have five gunners and five brawlers. From here, here the villain player will also receive the four stops tokens and a number of focus tokens based on the mission. So we are playing with the first one, so we'll have four. And finally, the villain's deck, which will have 25 cards in it, and I'll explain in just a second how to construct that. The last part of the villain setup phase is to, to construct your villain deck. You will do this by referencing the adventure book, and right above the map tile setup is going to be pictures, as you guys can see here, of the different villains and leaders the pictures of their minis and the color stripes will be the colors of the decks that you will include in your villain deck. And your villain deck is always going to have 25 cards. So in our first battle, we will have four of the red, blue, and green cards for the Thug Gunner. And again, four of the red, blue, and green cards for the... Uh, the Thug Brawler. And then we will also gain the Regroup card. From here, you'll go ahead and shuffle up all those cards. And to start the uh, first villain phase, you would draw five cards from that, and that'll be your starting hand. The villain ability cards are what make up the villain deck. When played, each one of these cards will activate the villains pictured on the card. And so at the top of this card here, for example, we have the name of the villain, the picture of the villain, and the number of villains of that type it will activate. So we can activate one Thug Brawler when we play this card. When a, when a card is played, it will have a number of icons listed on the side, and these are the action icons that you can perform with that, that villain, just as you can with the turtles spinning their action dice. 
Now, when a card activates multiple villains of the same type, so for example, if this one activated two Thug Brawlers, each Brawler would have to be activated individually and has to carry out all his actions before the next one can be activated. Some of the cards when activated will also have a defensive bonus that will apply to all of the villain of that type until the card has been discarded from the action line, which we will take a closer look at during the villain's phase. Some of the other cards will also have special abilities that are listed on them, and these abilities will be activated based on what they say. So for example, with this first one here, when played, these will be resolved immediately when the card is played and before any of the action icons are resolved. The, another one we have is, to, uh, is when discarded, which these will be effect, will take place when they are discarded from the line. The next one is during this turn, and this ability is active from the moment the card is played until the villain's turn ends. And the last one is while active, which will mean that uh, it'll be active until it is discarded from the line in front of the villain player. So, and like I said, we will cover these more during the villain's turn. Once the players have agreed on a mission that they would like to go on, then you would set up the board just like it is shown in the, advent the adventure comic. So for our first battle here, we have our two tiles out already, and each tile is going to have an identification number on it, so you can reference that and set it up. From here, we're going to place out all the tokens that we need. From here, we're going to go ahead and set out the minions that we need in their spaces. And we can set out the villain player's cards and stuff, just like we've already seen and set up. Place out the train cards so that all players can see them at all times. And finally, the turtles players can place out their figures. From here, we're ready to start the game. When setting up a battle, at the beginning of the setup, it's going to list the different train cards that you're going to pull out for that battle, which will be all the different train features that are in that battle. So each one of these cards, there are two different types, will have different train features on it, and will explain the rules that are for those train pieces. So, for example, with any space that is, has a yellow border around it, it is considered slow terrain and it will cost an additional movement point to enter that space. Then we also have the train cards that have special train moves on them, which any character or villain can perform by spending the number of skateboards or other icons that are listed in the bottom corner for that card, and then just following the rules on them. And I'll take a closer look at these when we're playing through the first turn of the mission. Let's take a closer look at the action dice now and how the symbols on them work. So before we get into that, during a turtle's turn he's going to have a number of manacle covers equal to the number of action dice that he has, and those will include the two dice that he's sharing with other turtles. When he spends the symbol that's on an action dice, he will go ahead and cover that symbol up to represent that he's used it, as each dice can only be used once per the turtle's turn. On top of that, some of the, di the dice that the turtles have will have multiple symbols. When you spend those dice, you have to use all the symbols on them. You cannot split them and only use one of the symbols on the dice. So from here, we're going to go ahead and cover the first symbol, which is a turtle shell. So a turtle that has a turtle shell in their action dice, or that shares a turtle shell with another turtle, so for example, if Raphael's shell was here, then, he, then Leonardo would also benefit from it. So a turtle shell is not technically in action. It is a defensive icon. So, for example, any time that Raphael during this turn has to take a defensive roll, he will get three defensive dice based on his stat on his card. And on top of that, he will also receive one defensive dice for each turtle shell that he has. So during this turn, any time he takes a hit, he will get five defensive dice. And that will follow for any other turtle as well. So, for example, if he was sharing his dice with Leo, Anytime Leo would take a defensive roll, he would get three dice for his defense plus the one that he's sharing. From there, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the skateboard. So for each skateboard that a turtle spends, they will get their movement value in movement points. So for example, with Leonardo, if he spends a skateboard, he can move up to three spaces. If he, was able, if he spent his skateboard and Mikey's skateboard that he's sharing, then he can move up to a total of six spaces. So each space is considered one space, so a turtle that moves would move from one space to another. The only exception to this is terrain features will change that, and other models that are adjacent to them for enemies. For each enemy model that is adjacent to a, a turtle, 
that when that turtle moves, it will cost one additional point of movement to get away. So for example, if Leonardo spent his skateboard here to move three points and Mikey's to move a total of six spaces, and he chose to move here, this one would cost him two points to move into as there is one guy there plus the point to move. And if he chose to move again, he would have to spend one, two, and three points to move away. So that was five points of movement to do that. And this will also apply for the villain models during their movements. If they are adjacent to turtles, then they will also have to expend additional points of movement to move away. From here, let's go ahead and take a look at the two combat dice, which are the katana and the shuken. So the first one we're going to look at is the shuken, which is a ranged attack. And there's a couple rules that govern that. When you make a ranged attack, it cannot be against any model that is adjacent to your model. And you have to have line of sight to that model. So, for example, with Raphael, since he's got a couple of shuken, he's going to go ahead and make a ranged attack. And so he can target any model that he can see, which is by drawing a straight line from his model, a center to the center of his model, to the center of an enemy model. If it crosses any terrain that's considered blocking terrain, then he does not have line of sight. He can draw line of sight through other figures, both friends and enemy. And like we said, he has to target a figure that is not adjacent to him, so he could target any of these figures here. On top of that, if he targets a figure that's a beyond two spaces away, for each additional space that he's away from that model, he will lose one hit on his dice results as the weapon will lose strength as, as it goes further away from the turtle. And this will also apply for enemies. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of this. We have two Shuken symbols, so we'll go ahead and spend those, which will give him four dice. And he gets two attack dice from his base stat. So we'll go ahead and give this a roll, and we'll go ahead and target this guy over here. So he rolls five hits, and he is one, two, three spaces away, so he's going to lose one hit automatically. And then this guy will get his defensive roll, which is two defensive dice. And he doesn't roll any shells, so he has not blocked any hits. So Raphael will end up doing four damage to him, which will remove him from the battle as it'll kill him. From there, the last dice we're going to look at is the katana. The katana is going to be the melee combat. And so you have to target a figure that is adjacent to your figure in one of the eight spaces surrounding him. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at Leo here against this brute here. So he's going to go ahead and spend his double katana dice there, and he'll go ahead and spend the one that he's sharing with Raphael. So he'll get three dice for that, and his attack value is one, so he'll receive an additional dice there. So he ends up rolling four hits, and then the uh, villain player is going to roll his two defense for that guy, and he rolls two defense dice. So from here, we will do two damage to him. And the one other thing that I would like to cover real quick is focus tokens. So a turtle or villain player can spend one focus token to reroll one, some, or all of the dice that they rolled for an, for an action, whether it's a defense or an attack or any other reason that they're rolling dice. But like I said, they can only spend one focus for the roll. So if uh, Leonardo spent his focus to re-roll these dice, if he didn't like the second result, he could not spend another focus to roll that again. The one other symbol I would take, I'll take a quick look at is Donnie's. So with his, he has a unique symbol of the turtle shell and the katana. With this one, it provides one katana for a melee, for a melee attack, and it will always provide the turtle shell for the plus one bonus to defense for Donnie, and that will also apply to any turtle that he shares it with. So for example, with this one, Mikey would also benefit from the one katana and the turtle shell. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a game that is played over a number of rounds. Each round, each of the turtles are going to get to activate, and in between each of the turtles' activations, the villain player will activate and get to do some actions. When the villain player has completed his fourth activation, then you will resolve any end of round effects and then the round will end. This will continue until the win or loss conditions are met for this particular battle. 
So let's go ahead and say, for example, during this first round, Michelangelo is chosen to go first. So he will use his action dice plus the two that he shares with his fellow turtles. He can use any or all of them, and any that he does not use by the end of the turn will be wasted. And when he is done with his turn, then it will go to the villain to take his turn. At the beginning of the villain's turn, he will give Mikey a stop sign, meaning that his turtle cannot be activated again this round. From there, then if he has four cards in his track line, he will discard the first two and then move the other two over. During the villain's turn, then, he can play two of his cards from his hand, any two that he chooses. So let's go ahead and say that he plays these two here. At the end of his turn, then it'll go back to the turtles, and they will choose another one of their members that has not gone this round to activate. So we'll go ahead and say that Raphael went next. So he has done all of his actions, and then the villain player has given him his stop sign. From there, then the villain player will go ahead and play two additional cards for his turn. At the end of his turn, he'll refill his hands with two new cards, and we'll go back to the turtle players. Their last two options are Leonardo or Donatello, so we'll go ahead and say that Leonardo takes his turn, and it'll go back to the villain player. Leonardo gets his stop sign, and the villain player has four cards in his track, so he will take the first two and remove them, and the last two that are played are moved over, and then he will play two additional cards of his choice. From here, then it goes back to the turtle players to activate their last turtle, he will get a stop sign, and the villain player will go with his last turn. He discards the first two cards in the line and moves these down and plays the next two of his choice. When his final turn is done for the round, then the round will end, he will receive one focus token as long as he has, has not had his max, which in this battle, the max focus that the villain can have is four. So in this situation, he wouldn't get any back, but most likely he would use... Uh, focus during his turn to reroll stuff and at this point then you would simply reset and the villain player will get the stop signs back the turtles will go ahead and reroll their dice just like we've already talked about and you would start a new round at the beginning of each round the turtles players are going to roll their action dice and these will be the actions they can perform during the turn the turtles will line up their actions in a straight line as the actions to their left and right will affect the turtles on those sides as well. The one exception to this is Raphael. He will not take or use, be able to use the actions from other turtles as that is why he has six dice. But again, he will share his results, so he will have to have his in the line as well because the end results will be shared with the turtles to his left and right. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So each turtle player is gonna roll their dice and they are allowed to spend any one focus to re-roll any of the dice that they want. From here, again, they will line up their dice depending upon what they want, and they will resolve any chi symbols. So as Raphael has rolled two chi, he will be able to regain two dice of hit points if he had taken any. He can regain up to one, hip, or one focus uh, token for each one of those up to his maximum focus, and then he can change the symbols to any symbol that he wants on the dice. And the same for Mikey, he can do the same thing, and so he's going to change his symbol. And Leo also has one, so we'll go ahead and change that. From here, then the Turtles players, like I said, will line up their dice. So Leo's going to go ahead and do that so that he will share a double katana with Mikey. Uh, Mikey's going to go ahead and do that so that he shares the skateboard with Leo and the Shuken with uh, Donnie. Donnie will go ahead and do that. And then Raphael will go ahead and do that. To start around, the turtle players are going to roll their action dice, as you guys have already seen me do. From there, they can spend their focus token to reroll any other dice that they want to if they would like. And after that, then they will choose one of the turtle players to be the first player to go in this round. This can be any turtle that they want. And so we're going to go ahead and have Michelangelo start the round. So the first thing he's going to do is make a ranged attack against one of the um, gunner thugs. And so he's going to go ahead and spend two of his Shuken dice. 
action dice. So he's going to cover up those two, and his attack is one, so he'll receive one dice for that, and two dice, one for each of the action dice he spent. From here, we're going to go ahead and roll, and we'll go ahead and say that he's targeting this one guy right here. Now, he is not adjacent to this guy because he's on an elevated position. So this is a legal attack. He rolls five hits. From here, then the villain player will get to roll his defense. So the street thug currently, uh, the gunner thug has a defense of two. So he'll get two defensive dice. He blocks one. So Mikey does a total of four hits. And the gunner only has one wound. So he will be removed as a casualty. From here, then Mikey's going to go ahead and make another ranged attack using his, his one-action dice from Raphael. And he's going to go ahead and target this guy over here. So again, he will get his three dice, two for the double Shukin symbol, and one for his attack. And this time he rolls four hits, doing very well. The thug will get to roll and doesn't roll any defense. And the villain player could spend a focus to re-roll that, but the uh, thug only has one wound, so even if he re-rolled and got two shields, the thug would still die. So he's not going to bother. So this guy will get removed. From here, Mikey's going to go ahead and spend uh, his uh, skateboard to make a move. So he'll move up to four spaces. One, two, three, four, onto the trash can or trash bag. So he is leaving the elevated position and dropping down. Because he went on the trash bags, he will not take any wounds. And from here, then he can perform his attack as he's done used all of his movement. So he's going to go ahead and use uh, Leonardo's double katana that he's lending him. And will receive uh, two dice for that and one for his attack again. And he's going to go against this street thug over here. This time he didn't roll so well, so he is going to spend a focus and re-roll those two shells. He rolls another shell, but gets two hits. From here, then the street thug is going to roll his defense. And doesn't succeed with anything, but the uh, villain player is going to spend a focus to re-roll that. And rolls two shells, so Mikey ha has done no damage. And then he's going to use his special ability, which lets him move one space regardless of any penalties for free. So he'll go ahead and move. Let's move him over here. And his turn is done. So at that point, then he can remove any of his manholes that he's used and bring them back so that the other players can use their dice. All right, so now that Mikey has completed all of his actions, the villain player will go ahead and give him a stop sign, which means that he cannot be activated anymore this round. From here, then the villain player can go ahead and start his turn. So what he will do is look at his action cards that he has in his hand and choose one of those to play. During his round, he will play two cards from his hand total. And so let's go ahead and start with this card here. So with this card, he's going to place it on is the first card in his track. And during the villain player's turns, they will put place cards from starting from the left to the right on their track. During the beginning of their turn, if they have four cards in their track, they will discard the first two in that track and then move the other cards down. So as this is the first turn, this is our first card, and this one will activate one of our, our uh, Thug Brawlers, and he will be able to move and attack. And on top of that, he's going to get two additional uh, defense, so that's a really good thing to have because this will stay active until this card is discarded from the active row. So let's go ahead and look at that. So the other thing is with the, the uh, Brawlers is that they can ignore slow and rough terrain. So we're going to go ahead and activate this guy, and move him one, two spaces. He ignores this piece of terrain, so he has one point of movement left, but he does want to make a melee attack against Mikey, so he's just going to forfeit that. So he's already, so at this point, he cannot use any more movements if he plans on making an attack, and he cannot compl or complete his movement after he makes his attack. He must complete all of one action before he resolves the next. So from here, he's going to make an attack. He gets two dice and rolls two hits against Mikey. Mikey has a defense of three, so he gets three dice. He doesn't have any turtle shells out, and the two dice to his right and left are not turtle shells, so he only gets three. 
and he rolls one block. So he's going to go ahead and take one damage. He could choose to use a focus, but he's going to go ahead and save that. All right. From there, then the villain player is going to play a second card from his hands. So let's go ahead and boost our, our gunners as well with uh, two shells. And they get, we get to activate one of them. And he will get to use two ranged attacks. Or he can group this up and use only one. On top of that, it says this turn, once per ranged strike, the street thug, gunners may reroll their battle dice for free. So this could be really handy. So we're going to go ahead and activate, we'll activate this guy over here. And he's going to go ahead and try to shoot Leonardo. So he gets his one attack dice, plus he's going to go ahead and use both of the Shuken symbols. So he'll get two additional dice. And he's going to go ahead and give those a roll. And he does roll five hits, so he could choose to re-roll any of these, but this is really good for him. So he's going to go ahead and hold that, and Leonardo will make his defensive roll. So he gets three defensive dice. Again, he has no turtle shells. And he's going to go ahead and spend a focus to re-roll those three. And he rolls two blocks, so he's going to take three damage. And that villain's turn is done. So at the end of the villain's turn, he can go ahead and draw back up to his hand size of five, and then it will move on to the next turtle player. So let's go ahead and take a look at another turtle player's turn. So we're going to go ahead and have uh, Donatello start this turn. But before he does, Leonardo sees a way to help him. So he's going to use his leader ability to move uh, two of the turtle's dice. So he's going to go ahead and take Michelangelo's dice, his uh, skateboard, and replace it with Don, or, uh, Raphael's katana, and he'll move it here. That way then Donatello can use the movement dice and will benefit from his special attack, which we're going to take a look at. So now we're going to say that it's Donatello's turn, and so the first thing he's going to go ahead and do is use his pull a kick. And so to, to do this, he must spend a skateboard, and, and a katana. So we'll go ahead and use one of his katanas. From here it says that Donatello leaps up to three spaces in a straight line and then makes an attack of plus three. We can also spend uh, an, uh, another skateboard dice to add plus one to those dice effects for each skateboard that we use. From here, it also says that leaping figures do not have to break away. Uh, they ignore slow and rough terrain and may pass through but not land on other figures. So we're going to go ahead and move him three spaces. So we'll, make, we'll move him here. And then he gets to make an attack. So he's going to go ahead and attack uh, this guy here. So he gets three dice for, for the uh, special attack. And he's going to get an additional dice for his attack value. All right, so he rolled three hits, and that's pretty good. So then the, the, the bad guys are going to get to roll their defense, so we get two defense for that, but now the gunners have an additional two defense, so they're going to get to roll four dice. And he didn't roll any shells. The villain player could choose to spend a focus, but he's going to go ahead and let it go as he's probably not going to roll four shells. So this player will be eliminated, now that Donnie's turn is done, the villain player is going to go ahead and give him a stop sign again. And then the villain player will get to do his next turn. So as we've gotten a couple new cards, we're going to go ahead and spend a couple of these to do some actions. So we're going to go ahead and do this one first, which will allow us to activate two thug brawlers. And each one of them is going to get two movement icons and attack icon. Now the one thing to keep in mind during your turn as well, is that when you spend a card to activate uh, minions, they can only be activated one time during a turn. So if I, the next card I spend, if it happens to be brawlers again, I cannot move the same brawlers that I've moved already. Now there's a couple of things I'd like to cover real quick. So with the villain's turn, if for example during his turn he's going to play one of his action cards and he needs to activate a villain desperately but does not have the card to activate him, he can choose to do a desperate activation, playing one of his cards that he has face down on his action line, 
When he does, he can activate any villain of his choice, as long as it's not a villain that's been activated at this round already, as usual, and he will receive one movement icon and one attack icon of his choice, either a melee attack or a ranged attack icon. Other than that, at the end of the villain's round, after he's completed his four action phases and the round is going to end, he would receive one focus back up to his maximum focus. So for this battle being four focus, the villain player only has two now at the end of the round, he would receive an additional focus. And, and if there is any other effects that need to be resolved, this would be the time to do those. The other thing I'd like to cover is KOs for both the heroes and the villain leaders. So unlike minions, the heroes and the villain leaders are not going to be removed from the board when they're KO'd. They will be turned on their side, and during their next activation, so for let's go ahead and take a look for the uh, heroes first, for Mikey, during his next activation, he will still get to roll his dice at the beginning of the round, and when his hero is activated, he will have to make an awaken check, which is listed underneath his health. So for him, he needs to have 8 or 2 awaken. So in order to do this, he's going to get the, a number of battle dice equal to his defensive value, plus any defensive icons that he has on his action dice or the ones that he's sharing. So he has three defense, so he would receive three action dice. And then as you can see on this chart, there are other bonuses that will add to his dice pool, and there are also negatives that will take dice from his pool. So in our example here, we have one minion, so he's going to lose one action dice because he has one that's adjacent. At this point, then Mikey would roll, and if he can roll eight hits, or greater then he would receive those life points back and can take his turn as normal. If he fails his roll then he would receive a KO token and some missions will list uh, one of the losing conditions is having a hero with KO'd or a number of KO tokens on him. Now each time the hero takes a turn he would roll those dice and if each time he fails he would receive an additional KO token. Now the villain player works pretty much the same way. When a villain is activated by spending an action card, you would again try to awaken them. Now the one thing to keep in mind is that you cannot do a desperate activation to try to awaken a KO'd figure. You must have an action card to do it. And again, you would roll the battle dice based on your defense plus the bonuses from the villain's chart for anything that's around them or penalties for having the turtles around them. The other thing that the villain player will do is to spawn minions at the end of the round. So when he does this, he will look in his spawning pool, which is the pool of minions that you will have off to the side that have either been KO'd or have not started the game. So from here, you would separate each group of minion uh, villains based on the figures that there are. So we have three gunners here, but if we happen to have any brawlers, we would count those two and you would take rounding up half of the models in each of those sets. So for example, with our three gunners here, we would take half of them so we would get to spawn two new gunners in there, and if we had a brawler, we'd be able to spawn a brawler as well. From here, then you would spawn those uh, figures back onto the board into the spaces that are indicated as spawn spaces. You cannot spawn any figures that you don't have spaces for. So, for example, if you had to spawn three figures but only if you had two spawning points, you could only spawn two of those. Now, you get to choose which ones you spawn. So you can take, obviously, the, the nastier ones or whichever ones you need more and spawn those in those places. So I hope that gave you guys a good idea of how the game plays. As always, if you guys have any questions, concerns, or comments, please leave them in the section below and I'll do my best to answer them in a timely fashion. If this video was helpful or you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing to my channel and liking my videos. Uh, every little bit helps and it, the higher up I go, the more, video, the more games and videos that I will be able to do and get from companies. So in a way, it'll, it'll win for you guys and it'll definitely help me out. So please consider doing that. And as always, thank you for watching my videos. I do really appreciate the feedback you guys give and, and the fact that you guys are watching my videos. So until next time, uh, as Michelangelo would say, cowbunga dudes!